Well, welcome tonight. Uh, my name's Steve Martin. I'm the president of Sydney Atheists, and it's great to have you all along. We've got a, a fabulous evening plan. Um, for those that are new to Sydney Atheists, welcome. We, we hope you have a great night. We hope to see you uh, often. Um, the first talk tonight is the psychology, uh, well, the series tonight is the psychology of belief. But Sydney Atheists are proud to present Margaret Ann Tate and Maria Fuentes, um, who are also members of Sydney Atheists, for this very special evening. Margaret is a research psychologist, whilst Maria is a clinical psychologist. In their own separate ways, they'll discuss psychological models of how religious belief is maintained in the face of rational evidence. Cognitive dissonance is a psychological term defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioural decisions and attitude change. As atheists, we often find that reasoning with, with religious folk, even seemingly intelligent ones, is akin to bringing, banging our heads against brick walls. What we're att attempting to counter is their cognitive dissonance. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Margaret and um, we welcome Margaret in discussing this fascinating topic. So before we start, can I get a, like a show of hands? Who doesn't know what, what cognitive dissonance is, or their understanding of cognitive dissonance is pretty much covered by what Steve just said in the introduction. Okay, great. Okay, so there's, there's some of you. Um, I'm going to go into the basics um, quite a bit to start with, and then um, after that I'll go into some um, experiments and studies that I hope that the rest of you who do have a little bit of a, a deeper understanding um, can still get something in. Okay, so here's an overview of the, of the talk tonight. Um, first of all, I'll explain who I am and why I'm giving this talk, so I'll talk very briefly about, I'll talk very briefly about my work. Uh, then I'll go into cognitive dissonance and talk about the, um, the definition and the dissonance ratio and the history, uh, which go, talks about some of the um, uh, faith and belief and uh, cognitive dissonance around that, and give you some hints on um, how to deal with people who are true believers. And then after that, uh, we'll go into um, how cognitive dissonance can be used to actually change attitudes and beliefs uh, and, and behaviour. My work deals with um, visual illusions um, and it's, it's mainly with visual perception. Um, there's lots of experiments that go on at the university. Here's me participating in some of them. Um, when you do participate you even get some cool things like you know, pictures of your brain. Um, but the, the work that I do, um, the research that I do is pretty much covered by uh, that picture up there in the right hand corner. We um, get people to sit in front of computers and then press buttons and then we <laughs> and we record their responses and then we make inferences about how the brain works. Uh, so it seems pretty pretty dry, um, but perception is quite cool. I like perception because it does deal with visual illusions uh, like this and I think that um, it's a good connection to other areas of psychology because if you can first uh, let somebody see that their brain can trick them into seeing something that isn't actually there, that isn't actually real, then it's not that far to try and convince them that perhaps their um, beliefs about themselves or their understanding of the world is also um, not a true reflection of reality. So I, I like that connection between perception and, uh, and the other fields of psychology. Uh, I also have um, a business. I'm a coach, executive and workplace coach. I'm currently doing my Masters of Science in um, Coaching Psychology at Sydney Uni. Uh, and uh, I have business cards somewhere if anyone wants to ask me about my, my work, my research work or my, um, my coaching business. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. So, next slide please, Steve. So cognitive dissonance. We'll go into the basics first. Um, a cognition. What's a cognition? A cognition is any mental process of um, acquiring knowledge, processing knowledge about uh, your thoughts, um, 
environment and your behavior. So it's pretty much, it's many me in mental activity uh, that's a process of acquiring of, of knowledge about those thoughts, um, your environment, your, your feelings, your um, behaviors. So cognitions can either be relevant or irrelevant to each other. So an ir irrelevant cognitions, for instance, is you know what I had for breakfast this morning has got nothing to do with my attitudes towards gambling. If um, two cognitions are relevant to each other, then they're either consonant or dissonant. That means that uh, a consonant cognition, for instance, would be uh, if I am Catholic, then that would be consonant with me following the Bible. So they're consonant cognitions. Dissonant cognitions, on the other hand, wouldn't follow on from each other. So if I am not religious, then I wouldn't send my, you know, if I sent my child to a Catholic school to be taught by nuns, that would be dissonant with my my belief that I'm not religious. It's quite an outfit, isn't it? So, cognitive, cognitive um, dissonance was uh, introduced by Leon Festinger uh, about 60 years ago, and he brought up the uh, cognitive dissonance theory, and in his theory, he um, proposes that holding to dissonant cognitions creates a psychological tension. That tension is unpleasant and we, we want to avoid it. So in order to avoid the un unpleasant tension, we either change our beliefs or we change our attitude or we change our behavior. So we change one of those <coughs> cognitions so that they become more consonant. So, what he came up with, and psychology loves uh, maths, so if you go on to the next slide, is the dissonance ratio. So the dissonance ratio says that the amount of cognitive dissonance that you're going to have is equal to the number of dissonant cognitions divided by the number of dissonant cognitions plus the number of consonant cognitions. So if we go to the next slide, so you can see here, that if you wanted to reduce your dissonant cognitions, you can reduce that by either adding consonant cognitions or by removing dissonant cognitions. So it seems fairly, I mean, this is a simple representation. Obviously, psychological constructs can't be measured in, in, in this kind of way with pure mathematics or anything like that. But um, so it's very representative. You know, representable, uh, and it doesn't really take into account that um, the weightings of each of your cognitions. So, you know, some cognitions are obviously more important than others, and, and some are harder to change than others. So, now we look at um, how dissonance affects true believers and when it changes behaviour. So, if we go to the next slide. If you truly believe something, what do you do when you're presented with contradicting evidence? A classic example happened in 1844 with William Miller. He predicted, uh, I, have to get, I might want to make sure that I get this right for you. He was a Baptist preacher and he interpreted the prophecies of the book of Daniel that proposed that Jesus Christ would return to earth around 1843 to 1844. So when the initial date in 1843 passed, the, um, his followers actually grew. And they, they in their, um, into their thousands, they became, um, the religion became Millerism. And some of them had given away all of their possessions and they waited expectantly on the new date that they had they had set a date saying that the, Jesus was going to return on the 22nd of 1844, of October 1844. So when Jesus didn't appear, the date became known as the Great Disappointment. So the, the Millerites had to deal with their um, you know, shattered expectations and also from some abuse from the community around them. So how did they deal with it? Some of them actually did um, go to their old religion or they went to a new religion. But the rest of them 
renewed their religion and intensified their faith and their belief. And they handled it in all sorts of interesting ways. Some uh, continued to look daily for Christ's return uh, and predicted other dates. Some theorized that the world had entered the great Sabbath and that the, that the saved should not work. Others started acting like children because they quoted a Bible passage that said, Truly I say unto you, whoever does not who, sorry, who, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So they all started walking around acting like children. And then some of them, yeah, some of them um, believed that Christ was now sitting on a white cloud and had to be prayed down. So so what's, what's happening here with the, with the dissonance ratio is that they are adding more weight onto their consonant. You know, they're intensifying their religion in order to add more consonant um, cognitions to reduce the dissonance. Um, Festinger um, was interested in this and he, he uh, wrote some papers on this thing, this, you know, when this happened throughout history. But he, they actually got a fantastic opportunity to see this in real life. Uh, and what they did was they infiltrated a uh, local uh, UFO religion called the Seekers uh, who had predicted um, an imminent apocalypse uh, and a, on a future date. So ethics wasn't a question back then. Um, the psychologist there, he went along, um, infiltrated the group, and then wrote a book called... Uh, Steve, can you go to the next slide? <coughs> when Prophecy Fails. So this um, UFO religion called The Seekers was... Um, what, the, what they believed was Dorothy Martin, who's pictured here, was channeling messages from a planet called Clarion, and uh, through automatic writing, uh, was receiving the message that the Earth was going to, there was going to be a apocalypse, a fantastic flood, uh, but that they would be saved by a flying saucer, and the date would be just before dawn on December 21, 1954. So the group didn't like any publicity, and they were very closed and security conscious. Um, but Festinger and a couple of them managed to get in there, and they recorded exactly what happened on the night when they were, as they waited for the, the flying saucer to arrive and take them away. So I'm I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it exactly right. So December 20, the group expects a visitor from outer space to come at midnight to take them to the spacecraft. The group removes all metallic items from their clothes, like zip, zippers and bra straps. 12.05 a.m. No visitor. Someone notices that another clock in the room shows 11.55. They all agree that it's not mid midnight yet. 12.10 a.m. The second clock strikes midnight, still no visitor. The group sits in stunned silence. The end of the world is less than seven hours away. At some less than seven hours away, the, the end of the world. Uh, sometime shortly after, Dorothy Martin um, breaks down crying. And then at 4.45 a.m., another message is channeled to Dorothy Martin. The God of Earth has decided to spare the planet from destruction. The flood has been pulled off. The little group sitting there all night long had spread so much light that God had saved the world from destruction. That's exactly what she had, had said. So that afternoon, the newspaper was recalled, and so in a total reverse from their previous dislike for publicity, um, the group begins this urgent campaign to spread its message um, to as broad an audience as it possibly could. So, so they've, they've completely intensified their religion, even though they were faced with this absolute undeniable evidence that what they, were believed, that what they believed was false. 
So when does disconfirming evidence like this cause a believer to intensify their beliefs? And it's important to know this because um, it might help you to identify it when you're meeting somebody and um, it might save you from wasting your time arguing with them. Um, and, and even worse, if you do argue with them, you could actually be making their religion, even you know, their faith even more um, stronger. So we go to the next slide. These are the conditions festing out, put these five factors together. So the first one, a belief must be held with deep conviction. So uh, if they're a true believer, their belief has to be relevant to their actual actions in, in their daily life. So that would be, you know, perhaps they, they pray every night or they go, you know, they say grace or, you know, they incorporate their belief into their, their way of living. The second condition, they must have committed themselves to it. So, this one is, um, they say that the, the more the commitment or the, the stronger the sacrifice, the, you know, the, the more that you're committed to it and you know, the, the more difficult it is to undo. So, so, if they're fully committed, they must have taken some important action to show everybody that they, that they you know, um, committed to their religion. So the, these first two um, set the circumstances of um, a belief that's very resistant to change. The third and the fourth set the situation where they can't, they, the undeniable evidence. So the third, the belief, their belief has to be specific so that it can be challenged. So it has to be related to some real world Thing. For instance, the flying saucer, they expected it to happen on a particular day. Um, the, the other prophecies of the rapture or whatever, they're actually predicting a certain day. So it has to be something in, you know, that, that is real. Uh, four, the evidence has to be undeniably, undeniable. It has to be obvious. They, they have to recognize it as well. They can't deny it, but that, that, that uh, the evidence says um, it, that it's disconfirming and they can see that. They have to recognize that. So these two, the third and fourth, put a lot of pressure on to the believer to, to change their belief. And if the believer is by themselves, then it's pretty difficult for them to deny that evidence. And it is likely that they could actually drop their faith or, or change their, their, um, their understanding. However, and this fifth condition is probably the big clincher. This would decide, this is the decider between whether they abandon the religion or the faith or whether it's actually intensified to you know to go the other way. So it's it's going to go one way or the other, and it's about the social support. So if they're part of a group, they not only support each other, but they arrive sometimes at more extreme positions. This is similar to um, like groupthink, um, which is a psychological construct that maybe some of you have heard of, the group think with polarization, where individual decisions, if you were to, to average you know, a group their individual decisions, then the group decision that they arrive at would be at more extreme than the average of their individual. So, and it's, I, I seem to think that it's a kind of similar situation here, when, when the group goes to a more extreme um, path than, than the person alone would have. Excuse me. So, yes. I, I actually don't understand this slowly at all. Okay. Right. And I'm going to think so. Are you saying the first four points are, are defining a belief and also evidence, and you're saying that that evidence will, uh, will backfire unless there's strong social support. Is that what you're saying? I am saying that the fifth one is very important because there's still the risk that there is still the chance 
that a lone believer by themselves, if they don't have the support, that they could actually, they would be convinced, yes, you're right, my religion is yeah, it's, it's wrong, I was wrong. They could still do that. But if they have this social support, if they're a member of a church and they, you know, they meet every week and, you know, their family, their friends are all, you know, behind them, then, yeah. That's what festing, it's not what I say. That's what festing in says. And I'll tell you exactly what he says. An isolated believer isn't likely to maintain their convictions in the face of all that evidence. But if the believer is part of a group, they not only support each other, but they, you know, so that's, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's the, the first four probably are enough on their own, but it's the fifth that's really the clincher. So that's, the social support is important. So, Margaret, are you saying that if someone was there alone waiting for the UFO and the UFO didn't come, that person standing alone, if they were just, it was their own personal theory alone, they possibly with no social support may actually give up their UFO idea? They could possibly. They might not. They might still be, you know, have strong convictions and stick by their, you know, and change the date or, or do whatever. But if they have the social support, it's it's... The social support is what pretty much makes it almost guaranteed that they're, they're, they're going to intensify their belief. Is that, is that probably explains it a bit better. Makes it concrete. Yeah, social support is really important. We're social beings and, and it's a very important part of our, you know, our psychology and, and we want to... I can understand that. Yeah. Probably still wait for the spaceship. <laughs> so if we go on to the next slide. So I put this um, Facebook slide in because I thought that it gave a good um, overview of, of what I've just said. Um, the, uh, and also it's a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, so when confronted with challenging new information, most people preserve their understanding of the world by rejecting, explaining away or avoiding the new information or convincing themselves that no conflict actually exists. That way, they avoid the unpleasant feeling of cognitive dissonance. However, cognitive dissonance is considered an explanation for attitude change. So when does cognitive dissonance actually bring about an attitude change or a behaviour change? I'm going to give you three examples uh, where attitude changes and one example where behaviour changes. So, Steve. So resistance to change depends on two factors. The extent of pain or loss to be endured by the change and the amount of satisfaction that you presently get by, by the behaviour. So generally our behaviours and our decisions are much harder to change than our attitudes and our beliefs, mainly because we've already done them, we've, you can't change what you've already done uh, or said. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. This was demonstrated by, um, Festinger uses the example of a child that's been presented with two toys. And it's called the free choice or post-decision paradigm. In this situation, the child is presented with two toys. These two toys are of equal value. The child doesn't favour either one. You tell the child that they have to make a choice between one of those toys and the other toy is going to go back to the, the store. So they make a choice. Just and what do you think happens to their attitude towards the toys? Hands up if they want that red one. <laughs> Hands up if they want the yellow one. Okay. Well, if you're paying attention, <laughs> cognitive dissonance, you'll change your attitudes to match your behavior. So if you have chosen the yellow toy, <laughs> then all of the bad things that you thought of, if you had any bad things, 
to think about the yellow toy is dissonant with that choice. So you start to change that attitude to like that toy more. And anything about the red toy that you liked, you start to change your attitude towards that because that's not in line with your, your behavior. So the free choice paradigm, and it has to be a free choice, it can't be something that's forced onto somebody. The free choice paradigm is that you change your attitude to match your behavior. Uh, so that's sort of like <coughs> Xbox, PlayStation. I bought my son a PlayStation that became his favorite one of the two, regardless of what he bought beforehand, <coughs> because that's what he had and that's what he was using. That's right. Well, did he choose between the Xbox and the he PlayStation? He chose, yes. Sorry, I, did, oh, I bought yes. him because he chose. But then yes. that became something. He would actually defend that very fiercely, like online and against his mates. Exactly. Yes. So the next example. Induced compliance, and this is a really interesting, I think it's a really interesting one. So, in this situation, uh, you don't have a choice. You're actually induced to do something, so you're given a reward. It has to be like a minimum reward to induce you to do uh, something. And then your attitude towards what you're doing will change to match your behavior. But it changes in accordance to how much you have been paid. There was a um, experiment done by Nell Hemrick and Aronson in 1969. What they did was they got a group of people to do this really, really boring task of moving pegs around a board. It was just like a tedious, boring thing. Um, but some of them were paid $2 and some of them were paid $20. So the people who were paid, actually, hands up if you think that the people who were paid twenty dollars thought it was a pretty good. People who were paid two dollars thought that this is. Okay. All right, nobody's nobody's going to put their hand up now because. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what happens is, your attitude will change, but it only changes if you're paid the minimum amount. Okay, so this is a bit different from um, classic, classic um, behaviorism where your, you know, your reward matches, you know, you'll keep doing something the more you're rewarded for it. In this situation, um, their attitude will change if they're paid less. And what happened with the people who were moving these pigs around the board, um, they had changed, to, they were saying things, oh, this task isn't so boring after all. It's a little bit therapeutic, actually. <laughs> and meditative. So, um, why do you think this is? What do you think is going on? Why would someone who's paid $20 not change their attitude to favor their behavior the way that the person who was paid $2 do? Any ideas? Uh, yes. Because the person who was paid $20 might have had higher expectations. The person who was paid $20 felt bribed and didn't have to change their cognitions because the justification for doing it is for the money. The person who got $2, it's hard to say, oh yeah, I'm doing it for the money. Oh no, I'm doing it because, you know, it's not that bad. So, so yeah, it's, this is an interesting. Sometimes this idea gets abused um, in... Um, in organizations with an excuse not to pay people well maybe they'll be more intrinsic uh, you know liking a room went to their job if they're not paid too much but yeah the, there's another example of um, something like this was uh, university students were asked to write a paper on uh, increasing student fees and uh, obviously that was something that they didn't agree with and then um, what happened afterwards is that some of them actually changed their belief towards that you know increasing student fees aren't so bad. But what happened was some of them, their papers were they they were told that their papers were going to be used in a meeting to actually argue for the case of um, increasing fees, and those people changed their opinion more so to match the paper that they had written 
than than other people who are just reading the text. So so there's also something about the uh, the costs involved, or what what happens to um, what you've done, your your behaviour, how it impacts on on others. So the the next. The next uh, example is effort justification. In uh, this example, there was a study by Aronson and Mills in 1959, and they, were, they discovered that people who were easily accepted into a group rated that group less attractively than people who had to go through more severe initiation processes. So in their experiment, women were asked, uh, they were put through this severe initiation process before they could qualify to participate in what they believed was going to be an interesting talk on sexuality. In the initiation, women had to re read obscene passages to a male experimenter. And then after that, the interesting discussion turned out to be a recorded, a tape recording of a documentary on lower animal reproduction. So, which was quite disappointing. <laughs> so, so, how did the women who went through the embarrassing initiation process respond? I've already told you. They ended up rating the tape recorded lecture more favourably than. The, um, the, the people who were in two other control groups who didn't have to go through those initiation processes. And another great example of it is um, people who wait for an hour to get uh, into a, in a queue to get into a restaurant. I don't know if anyone recognizes that restaurant that's just down in Chinatown. I waited in that queue. That queue is like, that's been like that for years. It's still like that. You walk past there tonight and you'll still see that queue. And the restaurant's rubbish. <laughs> the, this has been recorded, isn't it? Yeah, I have to be careful what I say, but I'm not going to go back. What's the name of the restaurant? But, <laughs> What's the name of it? I can't see the restaurant. You're not going back didn't wait long enough in the queue. Like, <laughs> Perhaps that's why I, I didn't wait that long in the queue. No. Um, so, the more barriers to entry, you know, the more valued um, the position. And that makes sense for um, professions like um, you know, doctors. Um, I want to know that my doctor has been through, you know, they've gone to medical school and they've done their registration and their internship and all of that sort of stuff, so that makes sense. But I think that other groups sometimes capitalise on that idea to um, increase people's perception of that particular group. And, you know, I can think of religious groups that would meet that bill. So, uh, okay, so then one more slide. When, um, when I told my 16-year-old daughter that I was going to do this talk, she was like, what's oh, cognitive dissonance? So I thought, oh great, I'll get to practice my speech. And uh, so I started to tell her and I got about a minute into it. It just, oh, mum, stop, stop. So it's like being a hypocrite. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Yes, it is. So she just rolled her eyes. Why didn't you just say that to start with? So, um, so I'm saying it now. I have to add that, of course. Um, hypocrisy is the an example of cognitive dissonance where you actually change your behaviour to match your attitude. So this the other the other three situations that I explained were changing your attitude to match your behaviour. This is changing your behavior to match your attitude. So the way that um, Stone, Aronson um, and colleagues in 2003 did this, to address the issue of AIDS, they had um, people advocate for safe sex. Then after they had done this, they systematically made them mindful of their own um, instances where they um, hadn't practiced safe sex or they hadn't used condoms. Afterwards, they then measured, you know, how many, if they went out and bought condoms afterwards. And they found that the people who had, who had um, their, the 
hypocrisy that raised awareness of their hypocrisy went out, bought more condoms, and more of them bought condoms compared to the other control groups who didn't go through this this procedure. Do so, you know missionaries in New Guinea are telling the natives not to take uh, take the uh, cure for the uh, HIV. This is true. Who's that? Mis missionary in um, New Guinea. So, Ridiculous. well, I mean, hypocrisy is, is um, what is it? It's, it's advocating for something that you don't do in your, you know, in your private life or, you know, your behaviour doesn't match what you actually tell other people to do. And there is a, um, you know, we're not always aware of our hypocrisy. We have cognitive biases and distortions such that we see faults in others uh, more than we'll see them in ourselves. So hypocrisy is, it's not just the presence of these things happening. Um, it's, you can't change someone's behavior unless you make them aware of it. Uh, but there's um, evidence suggesting that having power magnifies those um, biases and distortions. Um, they found that people in power were more likely to commit infidelity while at the same time condemning immorality. So I'm not saying they're more likely to cheat, but they're more likely to be hypocrites about it. And I think that, you know, we can see examples of people who are in power who who do that, who have hypo you know, they probably aren't really that aware, or maybe they are aware of it, but, you know, they're in power and I think that they must resolve their cognitive dissonance in, um, in strange ways. Oh, uh, Rita so, Ratzinger there. Yeah, so as a, um, as a coach, I help to raise awareness of, you know, discrepancies between people's, you know, ideal and their reality. Um, so that, that pretty much is about, you know, cognitive dissonance and that's how, you know, you try to help people uh, change their behaviours.